down. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We began last Sunday morning in a study of this book. We will be going through the entire book verse by verse as we go through it. And looking at different things, the main theme of Colossians is Christ as the head of the church. Now we know or maybe should know that Ephesians, the theme of it is the church as the body of Christ. So here we've got Christ as the head of the church. And the things that come about because of that. Now tonight, in earnest, we are beginning a study of the church. And we're going to be looking at the fundamentals of the foundation of the church tonight. This is a very, very, very important study that we are going to be doing. In Colossians, we're looking at the church but we're going to be looking at all of the different aspects of the church tonight. The young people, the teenagers are going to be up here for it, for this series, because they're going to be the future leaders of the church, and they need to get a grasp on how the church works, how it operates, and why it goes that way in doing the things that we do. So Brown Road can continue on until Jesus comes. One of the things we talked about, and I looked it up this this week, and I found where Brother Amos got the statistics. I mentioned it tonight, but just mentioned it a little bit this morning. 15 to 20 percent of all Southern Baptist churches are on the verge of closing. There are 900 a month that are closing up. And that should never ever be. It is because the people have gotten away from the Word of God and they're doing it their own way. And God never blesses our own way. Very important. Come back tonight as we start this, the fundamentals of the foundation of the church tonight. As we began in Colossians last week, we saw Paul telling them why he was thankful for them. The things that they were doing, sticking to the doctrine of the Word of God, loving each other, all of the different things that they were doing that had him say, I am thankful for you. Now this morning, he says, I am praying for you. And we're going to look at that this morning. Prayer is an activity that is missing probably in most churches. Now we have a prayer ministry here prayer team that meets on Tuesday night. We also have a prayer room where you can sign up for one hour a week. And you come, it's right over here, and it's got a combination lock on the door. You will be given the combination, so you'll be in there for that hour by yourself, no one else coming in to disturb you or talk to you. And you say, but how am I going to pray for an hour? There are enough things in there to enable you to... You're going to, after the first time or two, you're going to be saying, I need to run back over to the office and sign up for the second hour. Because an hour just not enough time to pray for all of the needs that are here in the church. So prayer is something that is essential to the church. Now we pray for people, and we have the deacons come, and if you have a need, you can come and they will pray with you. And we pray 
for a lot of things for people. We pray for health. There are people that are, at least two I know, that are having surgery this week. And we pray with them about the surgery. There are others that have had surgery. Mark, uh, what, about three weeks ago or something, and Don this past week, back surgery. Carl's having back surgery Tuesday. Linda's having another knee replaced on Wednesday. And we can pray for them that everything go well in the surgery. We can pray that they will recuperate real quickly and get back to work and doing the things uh, that they need to do. Ray doesn't want to clean house anymore, and he's got to. (laughs) So so he's praying for Linda's quick recuperation. And we pray for, there are just any number of things. We pray for finances. We pray for all these things. Other things, and I was thinking, well, what if people, what would I want people to pray for me about? And I thought, well, it's not that I become a wealthy person here on earth, because even if I, my mom was 98 when she died, even if I live to be as old as she is, I've done put two thirds of it in. So I've only got one third left if I make it that long. So wealth here on earth isn't that big a deal. But what I have in heaven is going to last for all eternity. And we'll see some of that, although it's not stated that way in the scripture that Paul wrote the letter that he wrote to the church at Colossae, but it became scripture. So we're going to look at Why did he pray? What do we need to pray for? If you were going to pray for me, these are the things that I would say are most important that you pray for me about. Now as we go down through it, there are going to be eight things that we need to be praying about for each other here in the church. Stand with me as I read beginning in verse 9 of Colossians chapter 1 and going down through verse 14. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. It's not, I'll pray for you and then I'm going to forget you. It's I pray for you, and I'm praying for you every day. Maybe multiple times during every day. We do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son, or the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Father, again as we come to you today, we thank you so much for your love and your blessings. Thank you for all that you do, all that you have given us, all that we know that will come in the future as we are obedient to you and follow in the steps of the Holy Spirit, and work in His power. So I pray today that we will learn more about prayer, how to pray for each other, what to pray for, for each other, and that those who have never accepted Jesus will do that today 
And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. So as we think about prayer today, and what should I pray for? For the other members of the church, and for all other Christians. Especially what should you pray for for me, because you know you can pray for everyone else, and you need to. But I really need your prayer. Because I need a lot of help. And that's where the help comes from. Through the prayer of the saints. As we offer up to God sincerely from our heart. The things that are there. The desires that we have. Now I could say I'm going to pray for Brother Ken or Brother Paul. And I'm going to pray these things for them. But if I'm just going down a list and praying a list, then it's not very good, is it? But if it's coming from my heart, and I really want to see these things come about in their lives, then I'm going to be sincere about it. Not superficial, but I'm going to be as sincere as sincerity can be about what I am praying for for each one of these. So there are eight things that are listed here that I counted. Eight things that Paul said that he was praying for the Christians at Colossae about. Those are the same things that we need to be praying about for each other, and for me. So he said he doesn't cease to pray for them and to ask that you may, one, be filled with the knowledge of His will. That you may be filled with the knowledge of His will. That you may have an understanding of what God's will and God's purpose is for your life. And then, as a church, that we may know what God's will and God's purpose is for the church. Now, the thing about this is, is knowing God's will isn't a hard thing to do. Because all we've got to do is read the Bible. It's God's will that everyone be witness to. That they have an opportunity to repent of their sins, and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's God's will that you live a holy, separated life from the world. It's God's will that you be a tither. It's God's will that you study the Word of God daily. It's God's will that you pray. It's God's will, and you can just keep on going It's God's will when we read the Bible and the Bible tells us there are certain things that we're supposed to do and other things that we are not supposed to do. It's God's will that we not steal. It's God's will that we not kill. It's God's will and just keep on going that it is not. So Paul prayed to the church, for the church, and he's prayed that they would be filled with with the knowledge of God's will for their lives. So there's a whole book of God's will right here. God's will for things that we should do, and God's will for things that we shouldn't do. But when it comes to living our lives, and being a church, Even though we know God's will, now the moral things about God's will, we have no choice but to either do or not do whatever God says. But what's God's will for your life? What direction has God chosen for your life? Now, a lot of us have already made those decisions, and we have gone a certain direction. 
whether it was God's will or wasn't God's will, that we did it. And many times we knew that this isn't what God had in store for me, but it is what I wanted to do. It is what I've known a lot of people, men that have been said they were called into ministry, that were in Bible college, that were in seminary. And later on, they determined that that wasn't God's calling for them. It's something they wanted to do, but it wasn't God's will for their lives. So they dropped out of the ministry and began to do what God wanted them to do. There are others that are doing things that have been called maybe into the ministry, and I was one of them. But I wanted to do all the other things instead of what God wanted me to do, so it took me a long time to finally surrender to what God wanted me to do. You see, you can have knowledge about what God wants you to do. And that's what Paul prayed for, that they would have knowledge about what he wanted them to do. But the second thing is that you may have be filled with the knowledge of his will, secondly, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom is knowing how to use the knowledge that you have in the proper way. You can be knowledgeable and not be wise. But if you're wise, you're knowledgeable about whatever it is. So Paul prayed, I pray that you be filled with knowledge of God's will, but that you also have spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom in how to use that knowledge that God has given you. If you take the, a church, take this church, and there are a lot of things I say God's will, and it's God's will that we do a lot of things. But what is God's will according to the wisdom of God that we be involved in first and foremost before we go on to everything that people may want to do? That's one of the hard things of, about leading in a church and being a church is there are a lot of good ideas, but you can't do all the good ideas. You can only do a few at a time until you get them done with excellence. Then you can move on to others. So Paul prayed, Lord, give them knowledge of your will, but Lord, then give them wisdom and spiritual understanding of how to use that knowledge of your will that you have given them. Then he goes on and says that you may have wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him that you may walk worthy of the Lord, that your life will be lived in such a way that you're bringing honor and glory to God. That it be pleasing to the Lord. Now you think about your life this past week. Was it pleasing to the Lord? Now it's not pleasing to the Lord because I say it is. It's pleasing to the Lord is only if I lived, I made the decisions, I chose the things that would bring glory to God over things that God would not be glorified with through my life. I made decisions that would enable the church to grow spiritually, and then when we grow spiritually, numerical growth 
automatically will come. But there has to be the spiritual growth before the new miracle growth will come. So am I doing that? Am I making these decisions in the right way? Am I seeking the knowledge of God's will? And then am I seeking wisdom and spiritual understanding of God's will? And if I have the knowledge of God's will, and if I have the wisdom and spiritual understanding of how to use that knowledge God gave me of His will, then I am going to walk to live in a way that will bring glory to Almighty God. You see, we say living the Christian life is hard. In one way it is. But in another way, it's not. Living the Christian life is hard when you're trying to do it. And you're working really hard at doing it. Living the Christian life is easy when we get out of God's way. Let God show us what He wants us to do. Give us the wisdom to do it. And if we are doing the will of God, then we're pleasing God. It's that simple. I know what God wants me to do. God has given me the wisdom and spiritual understanding to know how to go about doing what He wants me to do. So I am doing God's will, and because I am doing God's will, I am pleasing God with my life. I don't have to worry then about my lifestyle because if I am involved in doing God's will, I'm not out doing Satan's will. And it's that simple. The more we are involved in serving God, being obedient to God, doing what He wants us to do, we're not going to be doing these other things. We're going to be concentrating on serving God and doing what God wants us to do. So He says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful, producing in everything that you do. One of the things we'll talk about tonight and just, just a little thing to throw out. In 2015, it was taken 98 Southern Baptists to lead one person to Jesus. A healthy church is four to one. Now we're not nearly there. And so, well, the preacher's not doing his job. None of us are doing our job. Because all of us are called to be and empowered to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what he says here? That we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work. If we were to go back through the parables of Jesus, it is amazing the number of parables that are talking about producing fruit. That we as Christians have to be fruitful. We have to produce fruit. And I know there are a lot of things that people say and think about in what 
how we go about doing that. And some say, well, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Well, we don't actually produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that is, comes about as we are living obediently to the will of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, then the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit is there, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I think what it's talking about, when the Bible talks about us being fruitful, and I've said this here several times, so you probably know it or should know it. If you've got an apple tree, an apple tree produces pears, right? No, it produces apples. A pear tree produces pears. An orange tree produces oranges, banana, bananas, and on down the line. A tree produces fruit of its own kind. What are we? We are part of, Jesus said, He was the vine and we were the branches. And we're part of that vine. And what are we? We're Christians. So if a Christian is going to produce fruit, what kind of fruit does a Christian produce? More Christians. How do we produce more Christians? By personally witnessing to them and leading them to pray a prayer and receive Jesus as Lord and Master of their life. That's how we produce fruit. So Paul's prayer is that they understand God's will, have knowledge of God's will, that they get wisdom and spiritual understanding of how to use that knowledge. And that that will lead them to live godly lives that are pleasing to God, and not only pleasing to God, but that they will be fruitful in every good work. That's four. Number five is that they will increase in the knowledge of God. Now, I can increase in the knowledge of God by experience. By doing exactly what he's praying for here. That they know God's will, they have spiritual understanding and wisdom to understand God's will and God's purpose for their lives. That they walk worthy to bring honor and glory to God and that they have this knowledge, continuing knowledge, of God. So by being obedient to God, I get to know God. I get to know God through experience. By the things I do, by the way I live, if I am living for Him. You see, the more we do, under the leadership and in the power of the Holy Spirit, the more intimately we become knowledgeable of God. We're able to see God at work. When if we're out here and we're making our decisions and we're doing the things that we think we ought to be doing simply because we're a church, we're not getting to know God. We're getting to know us and we're getting to know our failures and all of these things. But we're not getting to know God. But it's when we get close to God and we're involved in the work that God has given us to do and we're doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit through those experiences. I grow closer to God and I become more knowledgeable of God. But also through reading this word. I become more knowledgeable of God. What's God doing here? God is revealing Himself to us through the pages of this book. God is telling us, this is who I am, this is what I'm like, and this is what you need to be, and how you need to live. As you follow me, 
as you are obedient to me. These are the things that are taking up, coming about. So he says, increasing in the knowledge of God, that was number five. Number six is that we be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. That I be strengthened, that you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Now we learn that God has put in us the same power that he used to resurrect Jesus from the dead. Through the Holy Spirit, we have that same power in us. That we be strengthened. Now, every one of us have muscles. Now, I'm not going to have him do it. But I could ask Cameron to come up here and stand beside me. And we both got muscles. Some may be just a little bit more obvious than others. And some muscles may have given way to other stuff coming in. But we've all got muscles. Now they get built up through use. Through exercise, through work. It's how they get built up. And Paul prayed for the church that they would be strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. Christian, the power is in you. It's not something God's going to give you later on. Because when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, and you at that very moment were filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 8 says that if you don't have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you do not belong to God. So we've got the Holy Spirit if we have truly accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. So you've got the power, but you may be powerless because you're not using what God has already given you to do the work that He left you here on this earth to do. You have the power to be a witness. You have the power to to be, live a godly life. You have a, the power to make a difference in your family, in your school, in your workplace, because God has already given it to you. And it is there for you. You have that power. So he says, strengthen with all might, According to his glorious power, seven, for all patience and under and long suffering with joy, so that we might have patience. You know how you get patience, don't you? You got to go through trials. Your patience has to be built up. But I like the way that he put it here. When he prayed for him, he said that. They would have all patience and long suffering with joy. So, as you're going through these trials of life, as you're facing these uh, trials and different things that are coming along that are helping to build up your patience, he said, I pray that they can go through it joyfully, just as he did, just as Silas did, just as Peter did, James did. 
all of the others. They never, we do You know, the Bible points out the shortcomings of the great heroes of faith. David was an adulterer and a murderer. And Moses, Abraham, Abraham said that his wife was his sister and let some other king have her a couple of different times. The Bible points out all the shortcomings of the heroes of the faith. But you know what you never read in the Bible, in the New Testament? Now, Jeremiah did a lot of complaining. But you don't read complaining about what they are going through for the cause of Christ. You're more likely to read that they were rejoicing as they were going through the trials and tribulations that they faced. And then number eight, that they would give thanks to the Father who had qualified them to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, that we would be thankful for what God has done for us. I'll wrap it up. Here's what God has done. He has delivered us from the power of of darkness, and conveyed us unto his kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. This is what God has done. He has taken you out of the kingdom of Satan. He has made you part of his family, adopted you, into the family of God, to where now you are a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're no longer bound for hell, you're going to heaven. And He has done that for you. And there are some of you here today that have never accepted that, that have never invited Jesus to come into your life, to be your Lord and your Savior. Look again at what he said here in verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been bought out of bondage to to Satan. You have had your sins forgiven, forever forgiven. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, and mean it with all of your heart, you are never ever going to be judged for anything that you've ever done in the past or are going to do in the future. Because those sins are forgiven. If you've never done that today, why not come and receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Christian, what is your prayer life like for your brothers and sisters here in the church? What is your prayer life like for me and Ken and Paul, the deacons, your Sunday school teacher? What are you praying for for us? Here's a good guide, a good list to go down by. But don't just go down the list. Let it come from the heart. And you know what, if we do that, I would be willing to say that there will be big changes come about in this church. That there will be growth spiritually, numerically. That there will be all kinds of things come about if we just right now 
get this prayer thing right and do it correctly from the heart for each other and see what God will do. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for all of your blessings. And I pray, Lord God, that anyone that's here who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior will do that today. That others that need to come and join the church or may need to come and rededicate their life or just come to the altar to pray that they will, that you will be glorified through all of it. And I thank you so much for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.